So I hope everybody's listening to me. Um, I'm Ivan Rosas. I'm uh, the professor and section chief of pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine uh, at Baylor College of Medicine. And I have the pleasure today uh, to introduce two dear colleagues uh, that I've been collaborating with uh, over the last uh, six to eight months uh, in understanding more about COVID-19. And as you will see in this presentation, uh, focusing on providing therapies for patients affected uh, with this disease. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Hanna El Sali, who's uh, an associate professor of medicine and part of the molecular biology and microbiology uh, section, uh, and also part of the vaccine and treatment evaluation unit at Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, welcome, Hanna. Thank you. I also want to introduce uh, a close colleague who work in the same section, uh, Dr. Sergio, Sergio Trevino Castillo. Uh, he's an assistant professor of medicine. Uh, he works both in critical care and infectious disease. He's a specialist in both areas in the Department of Medicine. Uh, and he uh, is uh, also at Baylor College of Medicine. Um, thank you. Oh, thank you, sir. I would uh, like to uh, provide some objectives of what we're going to be covering today to the audience. Um, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to do an overview of the standard of care treatments for patients hospitalized with COVID-19 infection. We really want to focus on uh, what has been proven uh, through recent clinical trials. Uh, so for that point, what we're going to do is discuss results of the trials that have actually demonstrated efficacy for patients with COVID-19 pneumonia. As you probably know, there are many studies that I'll, I'll outline in a second. Uh, that, have, that show some signals, but definitely have not shown efficacy. So we're gonna focus on antiviral therapies and particularly on remdesivir. Uh, there's a, re a recent publication that Dr. El Sali is part of uh, describing the final results of the remdesivir study. And then we're gonna shift to looking at immune therapies and without question, uh, we're gonna have to talk about dexamethasone, which is, uh, has a, a, a very strong uh, signal in multiple clinical trials uh, that surgery is gonna discuss. We'll likely touch on uh, some combination therapies that are presently being reported and tested. Uh, specifically, we'll, we'll mention uh, um, the potential role of remdesivir combined with baricitinib. The study was just completed and Hannah will briefly mention that. Uh, and also we'll, we'll, we'll probably discuss the fact that we're combining remdesivir and dexamethasone without any uh, real evidence suggesting synergy. And then we'll get into some of the controversial studies uh, and the one that we've chosen is one that we've participated in as well. Uh, so IL-6 inhibition uh, through tocilizumab, which is an FDA approved drug for other indications uh, has been recently completed and is undergoing peer review. So I'm gonna show you the results of that study. We would like to achieve this over uh, a 45 minute period and then we'll enter into a panel discussion which we really want to interact with the audience. And because of the dynamics of Zoom, uh, we won't be taking questions during uh, our presentations, but, but certainly we want to interact very closely with the audience uh, once we've finished. And I just really want to focus on this image of the world uh, and the numbers that are reported beneath. So as four o'clock to this afternoon, uh, there's been uh, more than a million deaths confirmed in the world from COVID-19. So I, I, this is the objective data, but I don't really have to, have to tell you how serious this disease is. Uh, uh, in the U.S. and in the rest of the world. The darker the color, the more trouble you're in. So without question, the U.S. Uh, is going to be- Dr. Dr. Rosas, yes. I think uh, we, uh, I'm not sure any, uh, we're able to see uh, the presentation. Um, oh, you're you, uh, sh yeah, you're not sharing your screen. I, I don't think so. Oh, that's interesting. Sorry, thank you for telling me that. Of course. And I'm gonna do this again. Can you now confirm that you're seeing the title slide again or not? Yes, sir. And now if I actually put it in presentation mode, do you still see it or not? Yes, I can perfect. see it now. Yeah. Great, thank you. So, this is the map, this is the blue map I was talking about. Thank you, Sergio, for rescuing me. Um, and then the other thing I really wanted the audience to know is if you're unable to catch a lot of the elements of the discussion, this is a website that I highly recommend. So this is sponsored by the National Institutes of the Health in the US. Uh, and this website will uh, be updated periodically, giving you uh, 
uh, a landscape of the clinical trials that are ongoing right now, and also trying to give you guidance regarding what is recommended therapy versus what is experimental therapy. So I highly recommend that you look at this website. And if you were not to remember anything from today, uh, this is what you should leave from this discussion, which is what we right now in the US consider the standard of care. Uh, and it's basically summarized very simply in antiviral and immune modulation, and the agents are remdesivir and dexamethasone. And what you need to learn from this presentation is when to use them, what populations you should use them, and where does the evidence actually suggest that there is a positive effect, because it's not in everyone, as our presenters will discuss with you. And I don't want you to make the intent of actually reading this table, because that's not what I want to do. I just kind of want to walk you through the website so that you can see the type of information that you can get. So you can see here the drug name on the left side, and then I'll talk about some of the adverse effects, potential drug-drug interactions, and most importantly, on the right-hand side, you'll be able to read the panel's recommendations on these different treatments. And let's start with a controversy, which is the use of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine in combination with the azithromycin. At this time, uh, definitely for inpatient treatments, these are not recommended therapies, and uh, I hope my panelists agree that there's more and more evidence suggesting that not even in the outpatient setting, this is, an approved, is a therapy that will be used long-term in COVID. Antivirals, uh, there was one of the first studies with a combination of lopinavir and ritinavir, uh, but we're really gonna focus today on discussing remdesivir when there's fantastic data really suggesting its efficacy. And there's a number of immune modulators, including convalescent plasma, immunoglobulins that may or may not be specific, uh, and even uh, cell therapies with mesenchymal stem cells are being treated. Most of these in phase two studies, some of, some of them are advancing to phase three, but there is no evidence at this point to use this outside of a clinical trial. And then we'll really get into the exciting data regarding the use of, of steroids in uh, patients with ARDS uh, and patients with high oxygen or increasing oxygen requirements. This was a true controversy until uh, the um, presentation of the recovery results. So this is really gonna be an exciting discussion and, and something that was actually surprised. I remember talking with Sergio about this while we saw patients in the ICU and you know he was very excited about steroids and I wasn't as much because I'm actually focused on treating patients with lung fibrosis. And, and there we really haven't had good results. But there's some really exciting data we're gonna discuss. There's also interferon therapies that are now transitioning to phase three studies, but they were not presently approved. And I'll talk about the most important controversy right now, which is the use of tocilizumab, which is one of the anti-cytokine therapies, and there are many of them that are presently being tested, like IL-1 beta, uh, the IL-6 receptor, the IL-6 ligand, and there's some, there's some kinase inhibitors that are also being tested. Uh, I think Hanna will mention the combination of remdesivir and baricitinib, which is one of these kinase inhibitors that have been used in rheumatoid arthritis. So the purpose of, of just kind of giving you this landscape is not that you would learn anything here. The learning comes later with the presentations of my colleagues. Uh, but I want to give you, just guide you to a website in which you can constantly be looking at the evolution of the data and how some of these trials actually may be showing alternative therapies uh, for COVID-19. So again, it's my pleasure to uh, now introduce uh, Dr. El Sali and her presentation regarding antiviral therapy. Thank you, Hannah, for being part of the panel. Thank you, Dr. Rosas, for this introduction. Uh, we will uh, begin uh, by examining the evidence on the role of certain antivirals uh, in the management of COVID-19, the positive, the negative, and the in-between. Uh, I have no disclosure. We will. We will begin with uh, the data around uh, uh, lopinavir, ritonavir, a, wide, a drug that is widely used in the management of HIV. It does, you know, soon in the, in the early days of the epidemic, uh, we resorted to drugs that had uh, activity against uh, the SARS coronavirus one, the one that erupted in 2002, 2003. There was some in evidence that the drug has in vitro activity against this virus and potentially uh, a signal for decreased adverse outcomes in human, uh, humans infected with the virus. Um, it has also uh, minimal activity against a MERS coronavirus. This was a rationale for a randomized controlled open label trial in adult patients hospitalized with COVID-19 with a primary endpoint uh, of time to improvement by two points on the seven category uh, ordinal scale. Next. So this study uh, enrolled close to 200 patients randomized one-to-one -one between control, placebo, or 
lopinavir, ritonavir. There was no difference in the time to clinical improvement, 16 days versus 16 days. And um, in early disease, uh, there was uh, lopinavir treatment was not associated with uh, any shorter time. Um, the hazard ratio crossed one and it was 1.25. There was no difference in the primary outcome uh, by baseline disease severity. So it did not matter whether the patient was in the MICU or was on the floor. And there was uh, no evidence uh, that there was a difference in time to deterioration either. So it seemed to not have impacted the patients either way. Uh, the mortality was comparable between both groups, although the study was not powered to detect differences on mortality, but in clinical outcomes, it did not improve on our management of these patients. Next. Then comes along chloroquine hydroxychloroquine. Uh, after a very small study from uh, Marseille in France, 42 patients uh, with coronavirus detected by PCR. Um, it was a case control stu uh, study, 26 on hydroxychloroquine, six of whom were on hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, and 16 uh, received standard of care. The outcome measure was virologic clearance. It was not a clinical outcome. And six patients in the hydroxychloroquine chloroquine were not eventually even included in the study. Uh, all they had positive PCR upon exclusion. In the final analysis, uh, 20 cases, 16 controls, and within six days, virologic clearance was seen in 70% of hydroxychloroquine recipients versus 12.5% of the controls. Next. This small study initiated a field of, of clinical trials, uh, all of which has been negative. In hospitalized patients uh, with COVID uh, who were randomized uh, to receive uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, or standard of care, um, the inclusion of hydroxychloroquine was not associated with any uh, in, uh, lowering in the risk of intubation or death, which was the primary endpoint of the study. Uh, if we look on the right, uh, some people touted hydroxychloroquine as a post-exposure uh, prophylaxis measure. And you can see, if you look at the dark blue and the light and the gray, that uh, those who got hydroxychloroquine and those who got placebo uh, were no different in, in, their, uh, in, in the percentage of those uh, who eventually came down with COVID-19. It, it was a well-powered study, 821 persons after high or moderate risk of exposure. And uh, the inclusion of hydroxychloroquine was uh, no different than placebo in the prevention of COVID-19. Next. Now, uh, if we are to take mild to moderate COVID, um, uh, 504 COVID-19 uh, patients who had mild to moderate disease were randomized to standard of care or standard of care with hydroxychloroquine or standard of care with hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. You, uh, the, the graph here depicts um, the, the clinical status on day 15, which is the main outcome. You can see that the, on day 15, there was no difference in the clinical outcomes of these patients, um, the, um, uh, regardless of what they got, whether they got uh, a placebo or these other two drugs. These studies, uh, many, many in the field argued need not be done, knowing what we know about hydroxy chloroquine, but regardless, they put the issue to rest. And as Dr. Rosas pointed out, this is no longer recommended, whether inpatient, outpatient, or for prophylaxis. Next. Uh, at the time, uh, early after the uh, epidemic, um, the, um, the many scientists uh, looked uh, for drugs that have potential activity in vitro and in animal models. Uh, uh, against SARS-CoV-2, and 
an obvious starting point was drugs with activity against a related pathogen. Remdesivir does have activity against MERS corona in, in, a, in, in an in vitro model and in an in vivo model at the time. Since then, they demonstrated that it, it happened, uh, it, it does have activity uh, against the pathogen um, in, in vitro and in animal models. But it was the drug that was taken to humans uh, in a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled clinical trial, uh, sort of the, the, the standard of, of clinical trials uh, to, to demonstrating efficacy. In this clinical trial, of which uh, Baylor College of Medicine was a participant, uh, 1,062 patients were randomized to remdesivir or placebo, and they could get uh, these, uh, the, the, the study product for up to 10 days, but if they needed to leave the hospital because they got better, they just go home. The primary endpoint was the time to recovery, and recovery was defined as the patient went home or the patient could have stayed in the hospital but is no longer requiring oxygen and is in the hospital, not for the management of COVID, maybe infection prevention, maybe management of a complication unrelated to COVID. The key secondary endpoint was improvement on the eight point ordinal scale. You can see that uh, the study was quite representative of, of uh, sort of the patients uh, we see. Uh, there's a preponderance of men compared to women with two thirds almost being men. Uh, the uh, age, um, the median age was uh, 58.9. <clears throat> the uh, race ethnicity included 53% uh, uh, who are white, 20% who are black, 12% Asian uh, and Latino um, or Hispanic made up 23% of the, of the pop study population. And uh, the median time between symptom onset to randomization is nine days, which is very uh, classic. Uh, when we take history from our patients, they tell you, oh, I wasn't doing so well. And sometime between day seven and day 10, I had to come to the hospital. Next. Next. Um, more on these patients, you can see that many of them had underlying medical conditions with hypertension being the most common one, obesity being the second most common one, and type 2 diabetes. Again, very representative of, of our uh, patients uh, with COVID. And uh, they were sick, meaning uh, a quarter of them uh, were receiving invasive mechanical ventilation or ECMO and the smallest minority actually was the one that's not requiring supplemental oxygen. Um, they were in the hospital with shortness of breath or cough, but they did not need oxygen. Next. And here's the median time to recovery. Um, it, this is the overall uh, uh, data. And I say overall because as Dr. Rosas showed uh, before, the, the, the guidelines sort of broke it down into um, who gets what, but the, the, the data are driven by the overall median time to recovery. It was 10 days versus 15 days. And the difference in the time to recovery actually was um, so evident that at one point the DSMB required that we stop the study for efficacy as opposed to stopping the study for, you know, a negative reason. And we had to, to stop and offer remdesivir to everyone who was on placebo arm of the study. Uh, that was based on, um, I think, over a third of the recoveries, but the data became even stronger as more, uh, more patient data accrued um, uh, and was analyzed. Next. Uh, now, um, looking at, at the data from um, a different perspective, which is the secondary endpoint, which is uh, 
the odds of improvement on the ordinal uh, score by day 15, you can see that the odds ratio between remdesivir and placebo was 1.5. With a, uh, with a confidence in interval of 1.2 to 1.9. So it was solid uh, improvement in the clinical status of the patient by two points on the ordinal scale. Mortality, uh, the study was not powered to detect mortality, but um, the uh, regardless, the uh, mortality in the remdesivir arm was uh, 11 by day 29, 11.4. Placebo was 15.2. And uh, on day 14, it was 6.7 in the remdesivir and 11.9 in placebo. So even for mortality, for which you know we were not seeking um, uh, that as an outcome, there is a, a, a solid trend there, al uh, although not statistically significant. Next. Since then, uh, there has been at least two other trials uh, looking at uh, remdesivir for patients with less uh, severe COVID uh, and for or strictly in, in, in patients with severe COVID, but excluding those with mechanical ventilation. Uh, mean, uh, and what the first study that was published in the, um, in the New England has shown that in patients who do not need mechanical ventilation, um, five days of remdesivir was just as uh, as good as 10 days of remdesivir. Um, in patients with mild to moderate COVID, and if you read the paper, you will realize that it's really mild COVID. 84% were on room air, albeit pneumonia in the hospital, but they were on room air. <coughs> also in, in that trial, five days of remdesivir as um, uh, they had a better distribution on their ordinal scale by day 11 than 10 days of remdesivir. So in patients who do not need oxygen or do not need a mechanical ventilation, it seems that we can get by with less, uh, uh, less remdesivir. Next. So, it's evident that, and, and, and my colleague Sergio is going to talk about this further, that there's an immune dysregulation uh, part of, of this pneumonia with, with the sars corona 2 So antivirals is one natural, uh, uh, natural go-to drugs to test in these patients, but also medications that uh, tamper the, the, the dysregulation of the immune response. So this is where uh, this study uh, comes along, ACT-2. Um, the ACT-2 randomized again in a one-to-one -one fashion, more than 1,000 patients hospitalized with COVID-19 pneumonia to receive either remdesivir or remdesivir with baricitinib. The patients on the uh, remdesivir arms also did receive an oral placebo, because, so everyone was blinded on this study. Uh, um, I can share with you the top line data. The manuscript is written. I think today we signed the COIs, so it should be out soon. Um, the, the median time to recovery was seven days in the uh, remdesivir plus baricitinib arm versus eight days in the remdesivir alone arm. And the, 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 this difference was uh, consistent and statistically uh, significant. The second the key secondary endpoint was improvement by two points on the ordinal scale, and it was more likely to occur in the remdesivir plus baricitinib arm with an odds ratio of 1.3. Um, the, the data, again, is are currently embargoed, and uh, it, it will be published soon, and we can potentially discuss it in a future forum. Next. I think that that should be it for antivirals. Great, Hannah. That was a great presentation. Thank you for that wonderful summary on antiviral therapies. Sergio, I think you can take it from here, so take the control. Yep, I'm going to share my screen. Thank you, Dr. Zari. Thank you, Dr. Rosas. So I will talk about the immunomodulation aspect that 
Dr. Al-Tahi mentioned. And to know where that came from is just have to see well, what uh, SARS-CoV-2 or coronavirus actually does to the lungs. To see where we're coming from to see why steroids are uh, um, now a mainstay of therapy. And we can, we can see here, we can see that uh, the coronavirus affects both uh, type 2 pneumocytes as well as the type 1 pneumocytes right here. And this elicits an inflammatory response here. This is where tocilizumab or anti-inflammatory uh, factors. This is early in the disease. It's mainly driven by the virus affecting the endothelial cells as well, affecting the pneumocytes, starting a, an inflammatory cascade. And then late in the disease, this leads to edema and swelling in interstitium, uh, extra vasation of fluid and pulmonary edema, as well as pulmonary thrombus. But this is all kind of driven by the inflammatory response that is elicited by the virus itself after it, it attacks these different ten, uh, cell types. This graph is something that's been basically that came out very early in the pandemic. It still kind of applies to, uh, to everything. And this is what uh, we, we can summarize how we treat uh, COVID-19. And so initially, first in the beginning, we have the early stage of viral phase. And this is where the antivirals or antibody neutralizing, uh, viral neutralizing therapies are, are most effective, which is why remdesivir is most effective early and for certain population. And for steroids, we have this host inflammatory phase. And so knowing that, uh, that there's this two phases or these two components to the disease is what guides our, our therapy. The antivirus and the immunomodulation right now in the form of steroids in clinical trials in the form of other medications like baricitinib, like uh, Dr. al um, mentioned in the uh, ACT2 trial. But uh, with this, we can see that we know from history that giving steroids to any viral pneumonia like COVID, it leads to poor outcomes, or we basically extend this. We extend the viral phase, which can, uh, can lead to a prolonged, uh, more uh, poor outcomes. This we saw in influenza and with other viruses. But so timing of when to give the steroids is key. We don't want to give it up here, but we, do, we don't want to give it up here because then too much damage is done. We want to mitigate this part. So timing is of the essence. And so in, at the beginning in the pandemic, there was a lot of uh, different uh, uh, opinions about using steroids or not. And the uh, first trials that were being done in China, surprisingly about two thirds, like in the first remdesivir trial that was in China, two thirds of patients received steroids. But then somewhat the, uh, the experience what, that started sweeping through Europe was that steroids are bad and they, they lead to worse outcomes. And so the pendulum swung the other way of not using steroids. But then it wasn't until um, June 9th of this summer that the recovery trial was, uh, where the results were, preliminary, were um, published in a preliminary fashion. They show significant mortality benefit when given steroids. And so that's the most uh, common, uh, most well-known trial. Uh, more recently, uh, a few weeks ago in JAMA, there were three more trials published as well as a meta-analysis. So what happened was the WHO, uh, the REACT working group from the World Health Organization had access to all the steroids trials, raw data, basically, they ask the researchers, give us access to your data as if we're part of your research team. That way we can start analyzing as if this was a one big clinical trial rather than waiting for all the clinical trials to be completed and then analyze it in meta-analysis fashion. So it was kind of like a meta-analysis in real time. And so I'm gonna present mostly the results there because this summarizes everything very nicely. Um, here we can see, this is the recovery trial. This we can say was who won the race. Uh, if you can see right here, it says planned sample size. Uh, with the recovery trial, it says not applicable. 
because they met their goal. But once the recovery trial published their results and it was positive, it became unethical for the rest of the, of the clinical trials to continue enrolling patients on the placebo arm because of such benefit. And so the, even though the rest of the clinical trials were published, their data is somewhat difficult to interpret by themselves, although we're gonna do that, because most of them didn't meet their, their enrollment and didn't have enough power to, know, to prove a difference. But still, we'll go through them. If you can see here, the answers that we're gonna to try to question is steroids, do they help? Whom do they help? Which steroids, what dose? And with this different, uh, in, in which patients? And so with this different clinical trial, we can see that here we have a combination of three trials and must control trials utilizing dexamethasone. Three with hydrocortisone and one with methylprednisolone. So we have a pretty, uh, we have all steroids, a different steroids that we can use. Uh, most, some of them were against placebo, the other against usual care, which most of the times remain, it wasn't steroid. And so, we're, and there are different doses, dexamethasone, six milligrams daily, uh, versus 20 followed by 10, 20 followed by 10, hydrocortisone 200 or 50 Q6, which is basically the same, or methylprednisolone. And so you can also see that this is basically all over the world. Or, well, we are uh, in Europe, Latin America, and North America. We're, there's one in China, but that one has very few uh, patient enrollment, and we're missing some, uh, and we're missing in Asia and Middle East and Africa. And so we move on to the next slide. And in here, we can see they uh, try to uh, divide the results based on which steroid. So it's dexamethasone, hydrocortisone, or methylprednisolone. So we can see that everyone is on the left side of this line, which is favor favoring steroids. The overall of all the meta-analysis favors uh, that you have improved outcomes, uh, with improved mortality with steroids. In the recovery trial, that uh, is the biggest one that ended up having the biggest number of enrollments, shows significant improvement. And they have a subgroup effect, basically, when they analyze just the patients that required low-dose oxygen, they benefited the most as well. We can see other uh, other trials like uh, this. Co this is on the right side, but if you can see, there's only 30 patients. That one was barely. That trial was barely getting started. And then methylprednisolone also has a very few number of enrollments. And this is important because traditionally for ARDS or um, it's a dexamethasone and methylprednisolone both have um, a less mineral corticoid activity. So there's less concern of fluid retention, which as we know can be harmful in ARDS. But here from this slide, we can say, well, it doesn't matter if you give dexamethasone, methylprednisone, hydrocortisone, the benefit is still there. So, okay, well, the benefit is still there. Let's see, regardless of steroids, let's see, regardless of patients. So here we have patients on invasive mechanical ventilation. Yes, there's a benefit. Yes, there's a benefit. And this is the oxygen from uh, the recovery trial that uh, they're requiring uh, uh, oxygen, but not on mechanical ventilation. And they're still beneficial. So patients that, the only thing here is patients that are on pressors and shock, it's, it crosses the line. It's difficult to say it's beneficial. But other than that, regardless of age, regardless of sex, and regardless of how many days someone's been symptomatic. Now this comes with a caveat that I have, I'd like to point out. Remember the slide we talked about the viral load and the inflammatory phase. So most of these patients it's, that are they're symptomatic by day seven, here it says even if it's early, there's benefit. I think it's still, um, uh, uh, I think we, we still should have some, um, we should be a little bit cautious of how early. If we have someone that calls us and says, hey, I came back positive, but I'm not even symptomatic yet, should I take steroids to save my life? The answer is you might be giving it too early and you might even make things worse. 
when people become symptomatic, by the time they're symptomatic, they're seven days symptomatic or they're symptomatic, they're usually farther down the line, even if they don't completely realize it. So it, it needs to be timing counts. Timing makes a difference. And so these are the results of that meta-analysis. And overall, if we go overall, is that in summary, the odds ratio was 0.7 for all types of steroids. So the effect was if one is there's no effect, lower effect, there's I mean improved mortality. So if they tried to look at it, um, dexamethasone, if it's only for dexamethasone, then uh, we'll do 0.64, still benefit there for dexamethasone. For hydrocortisone, 0.69 still for hydrocortisone, and 0.91 for methylprednisolone. So all of them show a benefit in mortality for uh, using steroids. The numbers go changing, but as you know, uh, methylprednisolone had a lot lower uh, numbers enrolled. So what questions remain about who needs steroids? The NIH recommends it now after the recovery trial. All trials, there's, there's definite benefit of steroids in uh, COVID-19 ARDS. But the question is, when's the ideal timing for steroid initiation? Too late and the damage is done. The inflammation has done its damage and it's worse and it's difficult to recover from there. Too early and you might propagate that virus to continue doing. So timing is, is everything. Uh, as a rule of thumb, and that's why the, the guidelines and that's probably what the, uh, also the trials show it is, once uh, you're requiring oxygen, then you're farther down the line and there's organ damage. And so that's the lungs. And so that's a good enough time that the benefits from stopping that fire, that inflammation from propagating, outweighs any risk of prolonging the virus phase. And so uh, that's a surrogate marker. But you have to keep in mind too then that uh, not all COVID patients present with hypoxia. A lot of them present with uh, altered mental status, uh, with encephalopathy or confused or delirious or with a lot of other um, symptoms. And so those are also signs of organ damage. So that may, uh, might be a, a, a something to consider. If they're hospitalized because of COVID, then they probably benefit from steroids. If they're at home, very unlikely unless they're already uh, uh, with low oxygen. So this is not a, hey, steroid saves or cures COVID. Anyone who sends you a WhatsApp message saying, hey, my uncle had COVID and I was in contact with you and started st taking steroids that was on the news, that's not the case. You might do more harm than good. So basically, not everyone gets sick and whoever gets sick would benefit from steroids, but they have to be on the path of getting sick. Now we talk about antiretroviral or about um, antivirals, then those the the earlier probably the better. So what's the ideal dose? As we saw, there's a lot of different doses on the on the clinical trials. Right now, mostly everyone uses dexamethasone, six milligrams, but you can use that or hydrocortisone for spread of those steroids or methylprednisolone. Um, uh, the equivalent of the six milligrams of dexamethasone is 32 milligrams of methylprednisolone. And so that for 10 days is what most institutions are utilizing. But there's a group of patients that remain sick or are sicker that need even higher doses of steroids. In the ICU uh, world, when someone's sick enough in the, in the intensive care unit, we, we, we tend to do this one milligram per kilogram of methylprednisolone, and that's almost double the dose. So what a lot of people are doing, this is not what the NIH is recommending, we do dexamethasone, but certain patient population might benefit from higher doses and also from pr longer doses. Those are questions that still remain to be answered. Some patients are very sick. After the 10 days, all the inflammation is kept at bay, and the moment the stairs are stopped, the next couple of days, they get sick again they get worse. And so these are questions that still remain to be answered. And then if steroids decrease the inflammation, then are other drugs like viricitinib or like tocilizumab that um, uh, Dr. Rose is going to discuss, would that make any difference or not? And the last thing is, 
that we talked about the duration. Is 10 days enough? And that's what we're doing right now. But uh, there might be a group of patients in which that's uh, not enough. And I'm going to stop right there. Sergio, that was, uh, that was really impressive. Uh, thank you. I'm not, I'm not sure what I'm impressed more with, with the data or with how well you manage media. You're, you're pretty impressive. I have to take classes from you. Uh, so first, uh, please confirm that you see my presentation, right? Yes, sir. And I'll be us there, right? So let's keep on in the, in the theme of, of, of the lung and what's happening in the lung uh, as Sergio was discussing in acute uh, respiratory distress syndrome. And uh, all of you have probably seen this slide sometime in your, in your career or read this paper. But really what I want to bring to your attention is that when we studied ARDS, when we looked at the endotypes uh, or the molecular signatures that are present in patients uh, who have ARDS, it's very clear that there is a significant immune response that's driving crosstalk between cells that are critical in the development of ARDS. And so I'm not going to go into detail, but you can see that IL-1, IL-6, IL-8, and other chemokines are part of this endotype of patients with ARDS. And this was what initially uh, prompted people to get excited about using anti-cytokine therapy. Uh, and, and again, we were very concerned about actually using steroids because in many studies of ARDS, uh, the outcomes of steroids were, were really controversial. Uh, so I think this is really, as Sergio pointing out, it's really opening up again, uh, this controversy and this discussion regarding the role of broad versus focused immune suppression. So the rationale of, for example, doing anti-IL-6 therapy was to actually be more focused uh, and really try to uh, modulate some of that crosstalk that's occurring between immune cells and structural cells. Because we believe that particularly in elderly individuals, some of the aberrancies related to this crosstalk actually may be leading to proliferative phenotypes that lead to scarring in ARDS. And I'm sure all of you are seeing the studies being published right now in the press that's behind the potential impact that severe ARDS is going to actually have on patients uh, who develop, who survive COVID. And one of the biggest concerns is the phenotype of fibrosis. All this taken together with, with some of the uh, peripheral blood phenotyping of patients with COVID, suggesting again that there was increases in some of these cytokines, actually led to the hypothesis that if we lowered or activated some of the specific cytokines, uh, there could be a positive outcome in patients we are with ARDS. The additional touch to IL-6 inhibition, in addition to modulating the acute events present in ARDS, was the fact that it's known that IL-6 is a modulator of fibrotic responses. So a lot of our patients with COVID are elderly. If they get acute lung injury, that's going to be a hit that probably is going to predispose them uh, in cases of severe COVID to actually develop fibrosis. And there's experimental evidence and clinical evidence that I'm not showing here that actually uh, IL-6 inhibition, both the ligand and the receptor, uh, can be modulated to uh, prevent aberrant repair through fibrosis. And so this was why people were actually excited about IL-6 inhibition, and they were giving it like water in China and Italy and all over the place. Uh, and so there was really the need to do a randomized clinical trial to see if all this speculation actually turned out to be true. And there are multiple studies, most of which were not no, no larger than phase two studies, that actually showed some signal in modulation of some of these cytokines that I've talked about and it's some of the outcomes, clinical outcomes that one would expect in a larger study to be positive. So this was the rationale behind designing Covacta. And so Covacta uh, is a uh, study that basically randomized patients to standard of care, which I think is something we really need to discuss in the round table because round, standard of care in my mind means a bunch of background therapy that we need to address uh, versus uh, the intervention, which actually was uh, tozolizumab. And I apologize that I'm not gonna go into details. This has actually been uh, already posted and uh, uh, met archives. And so you can actually read the paper right now. Uh, so, so I won't go into details because we don't have time. But essentially uh, what we did was uh, we, we screened 475, uh, 79 patients, uh, 450 patients was, uh, were ultimately randomly assigned uh, to either in a two to one scheme to either tocilizumab uh, or to placebo. And this table actually gives you the breakdown of patients who dropped off the study, almost a quarter of patients for different reasons dropped off the study. Uh, importantly, 20% of patients in both the uh, placebo and in the intervention arm actually died, uh, which is actually consistent with some of the studies. And uh, some of the demographics that uh, were described by Hana uh, are replicated here. Uh, uh, some of the limitations of these studies that have been highlighted both in the therapeutic intervention studies and the vaccination studies is that we don't have good broad representation of all ethnicities. That continues to be a problem in this study and something that needs to be further addressed. 
Uh, and like uh, Hannah described for some of her studies, the ordinal scale was also used in this study. And importantly, the ordinal scale, much like, much like in the Lupiniverse there study, was actually the primary endpoint. Uh, and there was other key secondary endpoints uh, that Hannah has already mentioned, and I'll go over it in the results. So for me, one of the most important things, and for the sponsor also, one of the most important things is we're giving a specific immune modulator. I told you already that we were concerned that when we were gonna give steroids, we were actually gonna have more infections and more death related to progressive sepsis or other complications related to ARDS. Uh, and fortunately, the recovery study and other studies that Sergio described, described actually suggest that no, that immune modulation is a good thing. Well, the good news is that uh, the broad use of tocilizumab probably didn't cause increased harm to patients. So when you actually look at the adverse events, serious adverse events uh, uh, and, and other infectious complications and non-infectious complications, there was really not a significant difference between actually administering tocilizumab uh, versus placebo. And the way we administered tocilizumab was a single dose or a second dose if patients actually did not recover. Now, again, I won't go into the details of dosing uh, because of time issues. And what's really important for you to keep in mind is that right now tocilizumab has no evidence of being effective in patients with COVID-19. So when you look at the primary endpoint, which was the clinical status on the same scale that uh, Hannah previously described and that I'm actually showing you here at the right of the slide, or when you looked at survival mortality, which is a very important endpoint, we probably just like uh, Hannah described, we're not powered to do that, but it was uh, a key secondary endpoint. Or when we looked at ventilatory support, there was really no difference if you actually gave tocilizumab to patients or not. And so for all intended purposes, Covacta, which is the primary, the largest uh, randomized uh, double placebo control study uh, testing the role of tocilizumab in uh, COVID patients suggests that there is no response. Now, for, for the right reasons, this is the way to describe the results and the statistical rigor points to that. However, there are some very interesting signals that still actually remain uh, puzzling to us. Uh, because when we actually looked at some of the endpoints that uh, were looked at in remdesivir, for example, and these were not key secondary endpoints, so they're not statistically significant, we actually saw trends towards uh, uh, improvement uh, in the duration of hospitalization, uh, the time to discharge, uh, and even when we looked at the clinical status at an earlier time, which I think is what remdesivir did initially in their studies, uh, we also saw a, a trend. So what does this mean? Well, I think like many things in science, it means that it's, it, it, it suggests that this actually needs additional data to test because the, the primary statistical design actually was not designed to look at these secondary endpoints, but to look at the primary endpoint, which was negative. And so for the purposes of using this as a treatment, there's still no evidence that this therapy is uh, useful in patients with COVID-19. And these graphs are just showing you the trends of, uh, of recovery in patients uh, with uh, tocilizumab versus placebo. Again, this is just a graphic representation of the data that I've already shown you. Uh, and the same thing goes for time to hospital discharge. So there's even a post hoc analysis that I'm not showing you here that when you combine some of these endpoints, you can make uh, interpretation of the data suggesting that if you gave patients with tocilizumab, they tend to recover earlier and they have least pro less probability to actually end up intubated. But again, the most important thing to keep in mind as a physician and as a scientist is that the design of the study was actually not to test that question. It was to test uh, the scale of clinical improvement. And from that perspective, this study was negative. The reason why I mention all this is because there are ongoing studies. There was just a recent report on a, on a second study called Compacta that actually used a different second uh, primary endpoint, uh, looking at the rate of, of, of uh, ventilator use or uh, the rate of intubation in this same population it was uh, somewhere around 380 patients. And what we know from Impacta is that that study was positive. And so one of the things that we need to discuss right now on the panel is why do we have similar studies with different outcomes? Um, and, and so that's something that we'll have to keep in mind. And the other thing similar to what uh, Hannah has been doing with uh, remdesivir and baricitinib, uh, there's another cl uh, clinical trial testing the combination of remdesivir and tocilizumab. So those results will be coming and we'll look better at these signals that for now are both controversial and negative. None of this actually suggests it's positive. So the conclusions uh, of, of this study is that there was no significant difference between tocilizumab plus standard of care and placebo plus standard of care and clinical status assessed by the uh, ordinal scale that we've been talking about. The, the time to hospital discharge at day 28 demonstrated uh, 
uh, a difference, let's not call it significant, let's call it a difference uh, that was favoring tozolizumab. And among patients that were not intubated at baseline, there was a nominally significant reduction in progression to mechanical ventilation. Uh, and what nominally significant reduction means is that for practical purposes of the study, that, that's actually not a positive result. It's just a signal that needs to be uh, further studied. Uh, but these, uh, these endpoints uh, suggest that there may be a response to tocolizumab. So these ongoing studies will help us define that. I think what we should talk right now uh, in our roundtable uh, is, is really which are the patients that are, are not uh, actually being covered right now by the present therapies. Uh, and therefore, uh, which are uh, the potential uh, areas uh, in which we could either combine drugs or use new drugs. So at this point, I think I'm going to uh, refer to our group for questions. Well, we see if we can uh, get any uh, questions from uh, our moderators right now. Uh, maybe we can start our conversation ourselves for a little bit. Um, I, uh, I I have a I have a, a, a something to this. So one is knowing who our is our, uh, our audience is. I'm not sure at this moment uh, a lot of the Latin American countries or Middle East countries will have access to vericitinib or uh, to uh, tocilizumab or anything like that. And so. What should our listeners focus on for treating our patients? And um, um, I don't know if uh, they have access to uh, remdesivir or um, or not, but uh, I think uh, oh, Sergio, that's a great question, yeah. and, and and I'm I'm just going to chime in very quickly to say, yes, I don't think I don't think it really matters where you are in the world right now. Um, there's only two drugs that actually have proven efficacy, right? And I think that's, that should be the message. And so I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the list right now. Uh, we're, we're talking to Peru, to Mexico, to Ecuador, uh, to Honduras, uh, and to Guatemala, uh, folks from there. And so I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain they have dexamethasone. I'm, I'm Colombian and I did medicine there, so I'm fairly certain they have that. Uh, the question is, and maybe Hannah knows the answer to this, what, what is the uh, access to uh, remdesivir in the rest of the world. Anecdotally, and I don't know that I've read uh, an exhaustive survey on the matter, it, it is being uh, distributed uh, worldwide. Um, what happens after it's distributed, the, the healthcare system in each country has its own uh, sort of uh, logic and uh, it has um, some of it is privatized, some of it is nationalized. So, but, but my understanding is that Remdesivir is making it to the international markets. So I, I don't see questions either, uh, Sir So I'm actually very curious uh, as to uh, the Remdesivir data. Uh, when, I, when, I, when I look at the, the final results and when I look at these follow-up studies, uh, it's, it's reminiscent to me of some of the clinical trials that we've done in lung disease in which the initial clinical trials don't really set, show a very strong signal, but as more and more data is coming in, uh, it's very evident uh, that this is a broad therapeutic in terms of severity. Uh, and it's possible that some of the uh, uh, modest signals that we see have to do with our scientific rigor when we're designing these studies and interpreting the results. Any comments on that, Han? Yes, um, the, 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 the remdesivir, uh, I think the, the, the main study where it was placebo controlled, randomized, and double blind, and the, uh, the large number of, of, of patients that were enrolled um, with the, the reasonably good representation of, of, of the, the individuals affected by, by the epidemic, at least in our country, um, sort of give reassurance on, on its role in the uh, fight against COVID, if you will. What I'm concerned about is that we are over-interpreting the subgroup analyses. What we demonstrated is that across the board, there was a marked improvement in uh, clinical status. Whether we, you, we look at it by ordinal scale, whether we look at it in time to recovery, 
the, the improvement was remarkable. And um, now the, the, the data, well, when you present the data in a paper, you, you, you show the subgroups. And now some of these subgroup findings are kind of taken out of uh, context almost. And um, guidelines are being built around um, around whether or not these patients should get remdesivir or should not get remdesivir uh, uh, based on these subgroup analyses. Right. So I think what you just said, which actually seems to me uh, a very important statement, uh, is that uh, beware when you when you consider a subgroup in, in, in which you don't see such as robust response as you saw compared to others. Yeah. Uh, because we may be under under reading or misinterpreting uh, some of these responses. And, and Sergio, I actually uh, have the same question for uh, for for steroids, which is uh, it seems like there's this 30% reduction in mortality if you're really really sick, uh, but if you're not as sick. Uh, you don't seem to respond as well. So any comments uh, in, in parallel to what, what Hanna just said in terms of, of, of cautiously, cautiously interpreting the results? You, you kind of addressed that when you said, you know, it's not for everybody. So, so let's go over this again. Which are the group of patients in which you feel strongly uh, that we should be using dexamethasone? In? And, and, and should we using, in, in what scenarios should we be using uh, dexamethasone exclusively as inpatient? Uh, is that the only place that we should be using it? Uh, what are the imaging findings that we're looking for when we're actually going to treat with dexamethasone? Guide us clinically as to how you would use it. Yes, um, I'm going to share my screen real fast uh, to to share that 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 old. I don't old. Don't mean old, but like the um, the the original graph. This one. So I think we so addressing everything. So here we have remdesivir. Right? So we, this blunts the viral phase, or, or at least that's the goal, antiviral, to make this shorter, right? And so if you have steroids, and I'll, I'll go into what Hannah said as well, if you have steroids, when should you give them? If you give them here, you cause more harm. And that's what the recovery trials showed. And so this is what you need to prevent with the dexamethasone or steroids or methylprednisone or hydrocortisone. And so I think that the subgroup analysis is, is a surrogate clinical marker. As clinicians, if you're on oxygen, then you're probably in this phase, somewhere in here where you're already seeing an inflammatory response. And we see this that it correlates with inflammatory markers. And so, so, uh, so, this, where, that's where the, the subgroup analysis comes. And so right now we're saying give steroids once you have a clinical marker that this is happening. And the guidelines are categorized as, um, as when you have oxygen supplementation. But is there a role or is there a world in which can you give steroids right here when it's just starting? Or can you give steroids even here as long as you pair it with remdesivir. If, you, if the concern is that if you give steroids too early, you prolong this, this way, but you're already blunting it with, uh, with, with the remdesivir, starting steroids, would you prevent your inflammatory response altogether? That's, so that, would you just get rid of this completely if you do both early enough? And that's a question that's still up for debate. And so the, 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 to answer your question is, as an outpatient, if you're not getting remdesivir, which you won't because it's only IV, then you shouldn't get steroids because you're going to probably go be in the side of the trials that show that steroids cause damage. But if you, at the right time for the right patient, they save lives. And those subgroup, uh, supporting what Hannah says, those subgroup analysis, I don't think are very anchored to what oxygen requirements they have. They shouldn't be anchored to that, in my opinion. They should be anchored into which phase of the disease you're at and which other adjunctive therapy you're at. So if, like I said before, if you're receiving remdesivir, maybe you should, you, maybe we will be able to give steroids a little, a little bit early to prevent decompensation. And, uh, or just by giving remdesivir too early, you do not progress to inflammatory phase and you don't need steroids at all. 
I think to our audience, I think what we should, uh, I think the take home message of our audience, a big picture at some points from your question is, uh, only a very small percentage of patients that get COVID actually get sick and end up in the ICU. And so we still wanna prevent all spread. We're not minimizing. But for those patients that end up very sick in the ICU, they're probably here already. And so if you don't have room desert in your hospital, it's not the end of the world. You can still save lives if you use steroids. Maybe one day we'll have a, another antiviral, which is in the works, to be oral, and that can be done as an outpatient to prevent people from even getting in, uh, hospitalized. So on I, note, I think- Sergio, on the note of maybe someday, I'd like to ask Hannah a question, which is, where do we go from here? Uh, when I looked at your baricitinib study, uh, combined with remdesivir, uh, I said, well, I mean, that's pretty impressive that you show in your primary endpoint a statistical significance, but when you look at the actual outcome, and I'm not, I'm not, uh, in no way am I underestimating what that means, but, but it was one day difference. And, and what I, what I see from that is that first of all, recovery was now me not measured in two weeks as it was measured in other studies. Now is it measured at one week? And what you're doing is you're quote unquote, uh, saving one day of care. Can you, tell us, can you tell us about the complexity of moving forward in the field now with the existence of standard of care? How do we design these studies? What's the, the size of these studies? I mean, it's going to be, I, I envision it very complicated to actually find other alternative therapies in the setting of this new standard of care. Any thoughts on that? Yes. Um, I mean, you, 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 you hit the nail on the head with one finding that I found puzzling in that uh, early in the days of the pandemic, uh, the av if you don't, if you gave the patient salt water, uh, the average time to recovery was 15 days. But if you gave remdesivir, it's down to 10 days. And so going in, the expectation is you're going to improve it from 10 days to something, or you're not going to improve it. Uh, well, now the baseline is eight days uh, with with remdesivir. So there's a secular trend that is unrelated to our drugs that is taking place, okay? Uh, so the, 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 the patients are maybe younger, for sure they're younger. I know the median age in, in well, I can say is, is a bit younger, not by much, but definitely uh, younger. And the, the older individual, I don't know, they're protecting themselves. They're not getting as sick and being admitted to the hospital, but we're seeing a shift in the epidemic to younger age groups and less sick patients. Uh, that, so, so, and I think that's part of the reason why we're starting off from eight days. We're not starting off from 10, 10 days, which is what would be expected. It's the same sites, the same, lo same location, same patients, same criteria for entry into the study. So we're, we will continue to have to evolve um, the, the, the data from numerous studies are being, you know, are coming, uh, the, um, the, the monoclonal antibodies, the immune modulators data in different populations, I think will be, will, will, we will see a surge, if you will, in, in data in the next three months. And, um, based on which I guess, uh, additional questions will have to be asked. Not, not the least of which is, what are we doing with remdesivir and dexamethasone together? We don't know. We don't know, correct. We, we do not know. We know that, for example, in the recovery trial, they started off with mortality in the 25% range. Well, we did not see that in the sickest of our patients here. So, Yes, the study was randomized. They took all comers, but that's an awfully high mortality that we are, we did not see it even before we had remdesivir or anything else to give these patients. So- I have to interrupt you because I have a question from the audience, uh, yes. which we really want to take. So, and I think Sergio is going to take this one. Uh, Sergio is coming for Dr. Sergio Ignacio Cortez, who is asking, First, giving you uh, a thanks for your uh, very nice presentation. Uh, and then uh, second is, what if the patient who gets hospitalized in your unit is on steroids or has been on steroids? So what do I do then? 
So uh, that's that's a that's a great question, and it happens a lot in all our asthma patients or COPD patients that are already on steroids, or our transplant patients. And um, it's we for now what we do what we do is we continue the steroids, but it, it depends on what phase they they are. Right? If, if they're on steroids, they probably have prolonged uh, viral replication phase. And um, you measure inflammatory markers. We don't take them off of stairs for sure, um, but uh, we 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 support them uh, with everything that the ICU does. You continue steroids, and um, if they're let's say two weeks out and they've been sick and just getting sicker, then if your inflammatory markers like uh, ferritin or CRP or anything are still climbing up and going through the roof then this might be a subset of patients that needs more immunomodulation. On the other hand, if this is someone that is a kidney transplant patient and comes in two days after starting to feel very sick, then this is the type of patient in which steroids is actually causing harm. We see that in those transplant patients that they're already on, on steroids. They come in, they come in very sick, very fast, instead of getting sicker at day seven or 10. And then those patients, those steroids are probably not helping because we're still in that first phase. Now, do you stop the steroids? I think uh, I, I don't have an answer. I think the, the short answer for now is no, because you might make the inflammatory response even worse once it kicks in. And two, there's a reason why they were on it. So you make that underlying condition also worse. But uh, that's a very difficult situation. And unfortunately, we're faced with it most of the uh, more often than when we than we would like. Okay, I think the doctors outside of the hospital may actually be thinking otherwise, right? Maybe they're thinking, okay, wait a second, you got you have a co co positive COVID test, you've not clinically yeah. symptomatic. Maybe you're in that Trevino phase in which he said it early and virus replicate. Maybe I should stop it. Now, if you go to the hospital and you see right. Trevino, you'll probably get back on the stairs again. Right? right, right. That's actually correct. I'm biased towards the intensive care unit. You're absolutely right. If someone's in some low dose. It, of prednisone for whatever reason and they were in contact, you know what? Yes, you're absolutely right. The right ends might be folded and then go from there. Okay, well, look, guys, I, I definitely think we need to talk with our hosts and have a second session. This is really so much data. It's just as Hannah is describing, this is like a, a fire hydrant. The water is just coming at you. Uh, there's just a lot of information that's coming through. And, and I would say, Hannah, we, we didn't even have the chance of talking about vaccination. So we definitely need uh, a second forum to talk about this because I think vaccines is really what's going to take us out of this huge hole that this virus has created in our lives. So uh, again, uh, Dr. Osali and Dr. Trevino, uh, it's as always a pleasure to uh, share the stage with you. That you did a wonderful job today, and I think you really have uh, knocked it out of the park. So thank you very much for your participation. Uh, before we finish, uh, Baylor St. Luke's would like to recognize and acknowledge uh, the following uh, entities for their support in today's program. Uh, Sociedad Peruana de Medicina Interna, Sociedad Peruana de Neumología, Hospital San Javier Medical Education Department in Guadalajara, Mexico, uh, El Instituto Nacional de Cáncer, uh, sorry, so I just got a change in the list on another slide, uh, El Hospital eh, eh, Instituto Nacional de Cáncer INCAM in Mexico City, uh, Sociedad Me Mexicana de Oncología SMEO, uh, QRA in Quito, Ecuador, eh, Centro de Medicina Integral C, Mater Dei, and Tegucigualpa, Honduras, uh, Hospital Semesa uh, Medical Education in San Pedro Sula in, in Honduras, uh, Hospital Herrera Yerandi, Medical Education Guatemala City. And I think I saw some others on the, on the other slide, so I apologize. Let me just make sure I got them all. Universidad San Francisco de Quito, Hospital de los Valles in Cumbaya, Quito, uh, Tegucigualpa, I mentioned, Hospital Semesa Med uh, Medical Education, San Pedro Sula in Honduras, uh, Gulf International Society and the United uh, Arab Emirates, the Saudi Heart Association in Saudi Arabia, the Emirates Cardiac Society in the United Arab Emirates, the Emirates Medical Association in the United Arab Emirates, uh, Top to Toe Trans Catheter Solution 4TS in the United Arab Emirates, and the Hamad Medical Corporation in Qatar. So really want to uh, thank you very much, uh, all of you, for your attendance. Uh, other than Sergio, that's a magician actually using media, I apologize for all the, the, the glitches. 
uh, and we really look forward to uh, further discussions when our hosts uh, uh, invite us again. So thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks. To both thank you. Thank you. Of course, Bye. Bye.